five, four, three, two, one, zero. And with that, welcome to your Media Mosh Podcast. I am your host, Shane Beauregard, coming at you with all your news, reviews, and previews. I want to watch on your streaming services, your television, and your local theater. I hope everyone has had a great weekend, and I cannot wait for January to be over, folks. It has been a very long month, and I do wonder if winter is ever <laughs> going to get here. I know that may seem like a little bit of boasting on my part, but I do like a streak of cold weather in the winter. It has been in the 50s and next week in the 60s. But I digress. It was a great weekend. Both my kids wrapped up their basketball seasons. So selfishly speaking, I get half my Saturdays back. Hallelujah. And there's no sport, at least until the summertime. So thank God. I have two big reviews for you this week. Let's get into the news. And I don't have a lot. I just highlighted a couple things I wanted to talk about. In this one, I looked up because I had someone tell me without seeing the movie what Dr. Doolittle the ending was. And I didn't believe him. Like, I seriously did not believe him. Looked it up on the Googles. I checked three or four different sites just to confirm this. And I thought the first two were lying. So I'm going to spoil the end of Doolittle for you with Robert Downey Jr. The ending essentially is him pulling a set of bagpipes out of a dragon's asshole. That is correct. The last scene takes place. It sounds like they could have been in the dragon taking the bagpipes out of the asshole. But essentially, he was backed up. That's why he was such an angry dragon. What the fuck? Like, seriously. How does that idea get greenlit? One. And how does it make it into the movie? Two. And how does it stay in the movie? Three. Now, originally, I thought this might have been a Disney movie. Because... Because I'm sure with Robert Downey Jr., he would you would imagine he has final say over the script, or at least some kind of creative input over it. But it's not a Disney picture, it's a universal picture, which still, it's Robert Downey Jr. There's no way he could have read that and be like, you know what? <laughs> that guy, he can write. No, that is fucking <laughs> terrible. And then of course I read some of the comments saying that because of the last scene, they want to go see it. No. That just drives me further away from that pile of shit. Uh, so, yeah, there's your spoiler. Dr. Doolittle pulls bagpipes out of a dragon's rectum. Oh, I can't make that up, folks. So, uh, the Fast and the Furious 9 teaser trailer came out today. And it's just F9, the saga. And I'm like, oh. Uh, and I am an unabashed fan of 80% of Fast and the Furious, okay? I like the majority of them. They're entertaining, and I do like Vin. I do like Vin Diesel. I'm not going to make any apologies, but in this particular teaser trailer, he is playing full-on Papa Diesel, and he's giving his little uh, five-year-old. It looks like four-year-old. Uh, it just it looks bad. I, and again, I don't know where they're going to go in this movie. I kind of forgot who they added as far as the cast, but he's giving his son the speech how he's stopped. He's not going to live his life a quarter mile at a time anymore. Which they pretty much stopped that around Fast 2 or Fast 3. I do give Fast and Furious credit from transitioning from a essentially a, a car racing movie into a full-on heist movie. So, uh, But I really do think the well has run dry on that franchise. That being said, I'll probably end up checking it out anyway. <laughs> but... But uh, go check that teaser trailer right now on YouTube. And moving on to Netflix's The Witcher, which has been reported to be in its most downloaded show up to date so far for the year. Uh, they are doing an animated kind of, and I don't know if it's a prequel or if it's like takes place after the show or kind of fills the gap in between the show. But it's a they're doing an animated movie called Nightmare of the Wolf. That should be coming out in 2020, so that should at least appease us Witcher fans until season two comes out. Uh, Adam Driver, you know how much I love Rise of the Skywalker. Well, I don't watch Saturday Night Live anymore. I haven't watched Saturday Night Live, honestly, since 1996, 1997. Now I just kind of get up and peruse YouTube and just check out the clips I want to check out. If you're a fan of Adam Driver in spoofing Star Wars, go check out Undercover Boss with Adam Driver, where he essentially plays Kylo Ren and goes undercover as a intern tech worker 
I I know he did the same thing after Force Awakens, which that was hilarious. This one's even as just funny as the first one. It's about four minutes long. A really funny clip from a show that really probably should have been canceled about 15 years ago. But anyway, I digress. Go check that out. The last bit of news I have is today it is announced that Richard Donner signed on along with the original cast for Lethal Weapon 5. Uh, listen, I'm... Who's not a Mel Gibson fan? Released prior to 2008, 6, whatever. I, I don't want... I don't think anyone wants to see this anymore. Uh, when was Lethal Weapon 4? Like 1998, 99, somewhere around there? And Richard Donner? If you're wondering about Richard Donner... He hasn't done anything since 2006, and that was 16 blocks with Bruce Willis. That was a long time ago, uh, so I have very little faith in this film. Yeah, so get ready for another dose of Lethal Weapon. And before I move on to some Netflix in the box office, there was a poll question on Twitter, and I apologize for forgetting who posted the original question, and it was this. If you had to watch one of these director's movies for the rest of your life, what would it be? Michael Bay or Zack Snyder? Which I thought was a very interesting question, but for me, it's a no-brainer. It's Michael Bay. It's not Zack Snyder. Only because I think over time, I would get so depressed watching Zack Snyder movies because they're all gray and black. Most of his fight scenes take place in the fucking pouring rain at night. It lacks color. They're all long fucking movies. And Michael Bay, as he went on in his career... Did make three hour long Transformer movies. Don't get me wrong. But still, you give me The Rock. You give me Armageddon. You give me Pain and Gain. You give me the first Transformers. I'm fine. At least there's some color in my life. You're giving me a little Megan Fox, a little Shia LaBeouf, a little Mark Wahlberg with The Rock mixed in there, Sean Connery, Nicolas Cage. I'm good. I think it's a slam dunk. But surprisingly, the poll showed most people would watch Zack Snyder's <laughs> film. So. Good question, but the edge goes to Michael Bay. Now, let's move on to the box office, shall we? Coming in at number five, Jumanji bringing in $8.1 million. Number four, Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman bringing in $11.1 million. Doolittle coming in at number three, bringing in $12.6 million. And that pretty much pays for Downey Jr.'s assistant salary. Coming in at number two, 1917 bringing in $15.8 million. And again, for the third week in a row, you have Bad Boys for Life bringing in $34 million. Now, next week at the theater, it's a pretty weak weekend. You have Gretel and Hansel. And yet, yeah, it's 2020, so it's no longer Hansel and Gretel like it has been for like a fucking 100 years. Nope, it's Gretel and Hansel. And then you have the rhythm section with Blake Lively and Jude Law, which I want to do that, but the only thing that scares me a little bit is there's no reviews out right now. Ugh, it's Tuesday night. So... Keep your fingers crossed. I am a fan of Blake Lively, so I will try to sneak that in. Now, as we're rolling into February, it's our last full week in January. At the end of the week, you have BoJack Horseman, Netflix Originals The Stranger, and Ragnarok shows all debuting. Uh, Ragnarok is like a modern take on Thor and Loki, and they're in high school. So it's like a Dawson's Creek vibe to it. That uh, looks kind of strange. I'll probably check one or two episodes out just so I can review it. Uh, then you have a little personal guilty pleasure of mine, which is Diabolero, which is a Spanish Netflix show about demons walking among us. So think uh, Supernatural, but set in Mexico, essentially. You got this team trying to track down these demons. It's been so long since I watched season one, because I think that was two years ago. And I kind of forgot the show even existed until I saw... Saw it pop up in the uh, up and coming stuff. So I'm going to check that one out again. That's a guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, then in February is a pretty big month. Uh, if you're a big Stephen Gutenberg fan, on the first, you have all seven police academies coming out. You have Dirty Dozen, a nice old classic movie. Prince's Purple Rain is coming out in the first. Shows coming out later in the month. You have Narcos, Lock and Key, and Altered Carbon comes out towards the end of the month. Uh, so I'll keep you updated on what weekends those come out. I am so looking forward to Altered Carbon. Lock and Key looks good as well, though I don't know much about it. I didn't read the graphic novel. or it. Yeah, I didn't read the graphic novel, so I don't know what that's about. But the trailer looked very interesting. 
And over on Amazon Prime, again, you have Midsumar, the Matthew Broderick Classic War Games, the Brad Pitt, David Duchovny, California, the cult classic Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and one of my personal sci-fi horror films, Cube, uh, is just dropped on Amazon Prime. Go check those out as well. All right, so let's get into what I watched this week. Folks, I tried to watch a couple episodes of the Goop Lab experiment, the, you know, the Gwyneth Paltrow shit show that's on there. So I picked two episodes out. I made it through half of one and about half of the other one. I'm calling bullshit on this entire series. Qu- In fact, Gwyneth Paltrow can go fuck herself because she looks so goddamn pretentious and smug with her little team of minions just sitting around her and telling us how she wants... Uh, She just wants to make experiences women could uh, enlighten their lives with and blah, 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 blah. But Eartha Gwyneth, but a lot of the women you're trying to talk about cannot afford a lot of these treatments that you're experimenting and promoting for women's health. Uh, Again, it's another fucking celebrity being disconnected with what the public can actually consume. Now, one of these episodes was about women's orgasms, which I I really went in there trying to trying to learn some stuff here folks and uh, yeah I came in with nothing they gave me this woman that I did not want to see orgasm I didn't want to see her bring herself to orgasm so that's where I kind of stopped it and I know that's kind of being mean on my part but uh, just trying to imagine like your lunch lady at school getting off I you don't want to see it it's weird and the other one was this energy manipulation where they had this fucking doctor he looked like one of those guys with the puppets with the strings what do they call it a mandolier or something you had that dancer, Julian Huff, who I can't stand. And it was like they were having an exorcism over these tables. And that's where I'm calling bullshit on. It's it's absurd, and that show made me more upset the more I watched it. So I had to shut it off. So, uh, And just for clarification, some of you may know this, but the vagina candle that I keep talking about, it is in fact, because one of my clients ordered it as a gag gift for her husband, and she said when she ordered it, it is supposed to smell like Gwyneth Paltrow's vagina. Which, how the ego behind that, like, I, I don't even want to get into it. But the size of your ego to put a product out there that's supposed to, which I'm calling bullshit on too, smell like your vagina. It, you're living on fucking cloud nine, lady. Like, unbelievable. So, yeah. Thumbs down for me on the goop experiment. Good luck, ladies, because the lengths of which some of you would go to, unbelievable. So, let's get into some good stuff here, okay? Enough with the crap. This first movie, I actually did want to go see this in the theater last year. It came out in July until I had someone come back to me and said it was one of the worst movies he's seen all year. It happened to be on Hulu last week, so I went and checked it out. And that is The Art of Self-Defense which is sitting at 84% critic score with a 63% audience score. This one stars Jesse Eisenberg, Alessandro, Navola, and I'm going to butcher this name, but that's your fault for being British, uh, Imogen Poots, or Imogen Poots, whatever her name is. And uh, Alessandro, you'd recognize him. He played Pollux Troy in the movie Face Off. That was Nicolas Cage's little brother. And he was also in Jurassic Park 3. He was the dude that was trapped inside Jurassic Park the entire time hiding amongst the dinosaurs. And Miss Poots, you would know her from the movie Green Room. If you've seen that, it's a very underrated movie. Uh, The abortion that was Black Christmas and the HBO show Roadies. And of course, everyone knows Jesse Eisenberg. Now, like I mentioned, I did want to see this in the theater. And after watching, I, I can confirm that I am so glad. I did not see this in the theater. So glad. I, it, again, movies that are a little contrived kind of bother me when you're trying to hit me over the head with your main message of the movie. And this one was a total talk about just being an alpha male and how toxic masculinity is. And they just went way over the top with it. Now, Jesse Eisenberg, for the most part, I don't mind him. And he, he does play like a meek, weak person very well. And that was his character. He is like an accountant at this firm. He lives by himself. He has like this little yip-yip dog. And one night he gets mugged by this motorcycle gang. And he stumbles upon a karate studio and decides to take classes. 
And the sensei there is a very eccentric, just way out there uh, instructor. That is your basic setup. But the way Jesse Eisenberg went and portrayed this main character, to me, again, he overplayed the character. It just wasn't funny. A lot of the jokes did not land. I did not like the, it's a terrible thing to be an alpha male. They go out of their way to belittle women, which, you know, normally I would not point out in a movie because some of it I feel is not justified. Well, in this case, it's very justified. And I know that's the main point they're going for as well. Like men are dominant over women because the main female, Miss Poots, is a brown belt. And there's one scene where the sensei basically told everyone that she'll never ascend to black belt because she's not a man. She'll bear children and get weak, essentially. And that women are really only good for fucking, essentially. The best part of this movie was the sensei. Because he delivered his lines very deadpan in a very dry manner. But it worked. His humor worked throughout this entire movie. But this movie was so predictable. Like, you you know right away who, <laughs> who jumped Jesse Eisenberg's character. And some of the plot points as this movie kind of rolled along... Did it make sense? It's like the sensei was had this nighttime, like, think Cobra Kai going out on missions at night, fucking people up. And then he would videotape some of these students, using it as blackmail so they keep paying the enrollment fees to his dojo. It kind of got a little diluted. And then there's a crematorium in his, in his dojo. It's a little bit out there at times. It's a very slow-moving movie as well. And as this movie is reaching its climax... Again, just like the beginning, you figure out who jumps them. You know exactly how it's going to end. It is very predictable. A, a major letdown for me, to be honest with you. Uh, I like the Poots character. She was probably the second best thing about this movie. Alessandro Novola as the sensei was uh, the reason to... If you're interested in this movie, he's the reason you check it out. Because he's so offbeat and he's such a character... You kind of gravitate to what he says because some of it is just ridiculous. But it works. And that's the only thing that works in this movie. Um, yeah, so not to say I would have walked out of the movie because I never, ever walked out of a movie. And I've seen some real, I've seen some real turds, folks. Uh, I'm going to agree overall with the audience score. I'm going to give The Art of Self-Defense a 2.0 out of 5 for me. Right now it's on Hulu again. If It's an hour and 45 minutes, so if you want to give it a try, you may like it more than me. But if you want a low-budget karate movie, go check out The Fist Foot Way with Danny McBride. It is a little more humorous, uh, but it doesn't have that dark edge that uh, The Art of Self-Defense is going for. So anyway, 2.0 out of 5 for me on The Art of Self-Defense. Now, I knocked out one more movie on my Oscar challenge. I went Sunday, and instead of going to see The Gentleman, I went and saw Parasite. And let me tell you, folks, I am so glad I went and saw that movie. I, I'm not going to sit here and proclaim to be a huge fan of Bong Joon Hoon, or however you pronounce his name. But as I've said multiple times on this show, I did like Snowpiercer. In fact, I did like The Host, which I forgot he even directed that movie. That was like a monster movie that came out in 2008. Uh, and then Okja was enjoyable. So he has a pretty good filmography over his belt where he doesn't really have any misses. And I do like pretty much the style of all his films. They're very his own. You can tell that they're his films. So going into this film, which is currently sitting at 99% critic score with a 93% audience score, I had a preconceived notion of what was going to happen. I think just not based on reviews I read because I went in here kind of blind. I just saw the, the scores. But it's kind of classified as an art house thriller slash comedy horror movie. Which again, they need to stop slapping horror on some of these films. Because I thought, again, I had one thought in this movie. And it just didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. Which was a pleasant surprise. And it went in a totally different direction. And I cannot throw enough adjectives out on how great this fucking movie was. It hands down is the best movie, or should win best movie of the year it's the best movie i've seen all year just nudging out uh, 1917 if you're looking for an original film that's well directed well acted just everything you want in a movie this is it essentially you have a lower class family that's living in korea and they live literally 
like in the bottom of a gutter, like in a basement. So the opening scene is them trying to get a Wi-Fi signal where they're at, and no one can get no one can get a Wi-Fi signal, and they're literally reaching their phones out to the top of the ceiling to see if anyone can get any Wi-Fi. They take odd jobs just to get by, folding pizza boxes. Uh, their streets being uh, fumigated for rodents and bugs, and they actually leave their windows open because they figure they get free fumigation that way. So you kind of get where they're at. But what I liked about it is they didn't make the family dumb or stupid or gullible. They made them smart because they're survivors. They're scavengers. And there is a son and daughter who were, I would guess to believe, just out of high school age, like uh, college age students. The son has a friend who is at university and is tutoring a rich family's daughter. But he's leaving to go abroad, so he thought of his friend to make some extra money while he's gone, he can step in and tutor this girl. So eventually he ends up landing the job through some forged documents and things of that nature. So busts up his resume a little bit. And there's this movie does have humor kind of scattered throughout and it worked like, especially the first half of the movie is kind of light. You kind of see how this kid's working his way into the family. Then eventually he cons the rich wife to hire his sister to be the youngest son's art teacher but he doesn't tell her that's his sister. He's like, that's my cousin's friend. And again, they forge all these documents and she gets on board. Eventually, they coax it where their father is the family's driver. And eventually, the mother is the family's housekeeper. So they've all infiltrated this family. That first half of the movie was was a great to watch this family and how they conned and infiltrated their way into this family's house. Now, from there... I thought it was going to take a dark turn. It never really did. Now, I will I will say, as this kind of movie's rolling along, there's one specific scene in here came totally out of the blue and just changes the direction of the movie. And from that moment on, the tension picks up, and all you're thinking about is, oh, shit. Like, how, what, like, really you're trying to figure out how they're going to get out of this What's going to happen? What's going to be the resolve of this situation? So it keeps you on your edge of your seat from there on out. But just a masterful stroke of writing. And even the directing, there's one rain scene in here, which to me was essential. Because basically, you have your play on social classes, upper class, lower class. And through some of the dialogue in this movie, they do break down and discuss it. And you get with the the low-income family they're talking about how... Uh, you know the rich are always happy because they have money and they can just iron all their problems away and then you get the wealthy family who the mother is just anxiety uh she's just anxiety filled she's worried about her kids uh and she's very naive and what i liked about this as well and i'm kind of jumping all over the place but as this movie's rolling along normally most people would set it up where you're totally rooting for one family against the other not in this case because both families, you like both of them. They're not doing anything wrong. It's just after a while, the little things start to kind of peel away and you get, besides the money, you get the differences in class. And that eventually comes to a head. And again, there's one big thunderstorm scene towards the tail end of the movie that really hammers this point home. And it was just, to me, brilliantly shot and just how little things like the weather can make a difference between classes because the rich family lives on one of the high points of Korea. They live up on this hilltop. So as this rain's coming along, it's pouring. It's And as that's happening, the poor family ends up running back to their home and they're literally running from the top of like where they are and they're just descending, descending, and they're just running lower level to lower level to lower level till they get to their house and everything is just, uh, their house is majorly affected by the rain. Okay, but their travel from up high to down low really illustrates really illustrates different classes in the society. And just his use of camera angles, because he shoots either from a down low point of view or a up high point of view. And after you watch the movie, you're like, wow, it kind of it kind of paints a nice picture for you. My point is, after the rain stops, the wealthy family wakes up and is thankful that it rained because it got rid of a lot of the pollution that was in the air. So they're not affected by it, but it just totally wipes out the poor people living in the alley. So just a great scene to watch unfold. And now, did I get every point in this movie? Probably not, because I'm not that guy. I'm not going to get everything this <laughs> this guy lays out. 
but I got the gist of it. A wonderful film. This is probably the second or third time it's ever happened in my show. I'm giving Parasite a 5.0 out of 5. So if this movie is still in theaters around you, I implore you to go see this movie. It is one of the best movies you'll see. I hope. <laughs> I only say that because, uh, you know, everyone looks at movies through different lenses. So uh, even a person like me who feeds on 80s and 90s action movies and pretty much lives in the gutter can appreciate a film like this from time to time. And that's what I did with this movie. I plan on owning this movie and at least exploring it two or three more times. That's how strongly I feel about this movie. Go check out Parasite 5 out of 5 for me. And that's all that matters, folks. And that's all I have for you. I have one more Oscar movie to watch, and that is Jojo Rabbit. I will get to that before the Oscars, and I'll lay out all my predictions sure to go wrong. And hopefully I'll have my gentleman review for you. So until then, folks, I hope everyone has a great week. Rolling into February. Please go to Facebook, Media Mosh. Check me out on the Twitterverse, at Shane Media Mosh. More importantly, people, go to the Apple Podcast Store. Download me, share me. Take a second, hit that five-star review I know you want to. And then circle back and go check out Twitterverse, the Grams, and the Facebooks. And check out Mr. Arger and myself, Chris Frodell. Three different platforms for three different types of content. In fact, he added a new segment, Wednesday Writings. So go check that out. Short stories I'm sure you'll love. Until then, folks, get caught up. Get caught up in the mosh.